Thank you. Um, I'm just looking as far as I can see. I'm hoping I'm not too much of a dot on the stage at the moment. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's actually the first postgraduate um, training conference that I've actually been able to attend. So really glad to be here and get the opportunity to meet you. Um, yes, within ESRC, my team is responsible for skills um, development of um, research skills and our methods portfolio. So we do a lot of work on setting up the doctoral training centres and the types of training that we'd like to see you um, undertake, but we don't actually get to meet you that often. Um, so what I'm going to do today is um, start off by giving you a little bit of an overview of the ESRC and who we are as an organisation. I'm imagining that for some of you, the only contact you've really had with us is that we are the funder of your, of your postgraduate um, degree. And obviously that's a really big and important part of what we do. We spend about £50 million a year funding um, PhD studentships. Um, but it's not all we do. Um, our overall budget is £213 million, so there's still um, obviously quite um, a lot outside of that. But before I move on to that, I just want to say a really big thank you to David and his team. It's an enormous undertaking um, to hold one of the conferences. And we might, we've kind of developed this um, phrase, which is almost like a voluntold. So we're looking for volunteers, but we kind of look them really squarely in the eyes. And they were kind enough to take us up in doing it this year. Um, so I'll move on. OK. So we're the UK's biggest... Um, funder of research and postgraduate training in the social sciences. As I said, we fund, we spend about £213 million a year. Compared to some of the other research councils, that's still quite small, but we managed to do an awful lot with it. At any one time, we're funding about 4,000 researchers and postgraduate students. We are actually 50 years old this year. Um, we were funded, set up in 1965. We were known then as the Social Science Research Council. Um, we're a non-departmental public body. Um, we are funded largely by biz, but we also do lever in significant additional funding from our partnerships with a range of organisations. Um, we did actually become the ESRC in 1983, following a review by Roth Lord Rothschild, which had said they wanted to, us to strengthen our empirical um, work, and that led us to become the Economic and Social Science Research Council. There's a picture here, which is actually our very first council meeting, which was in January 1965. You might see, and some of you are very far away, and when I looked at it on my computer, it was a lot clearer. There is actually only one woman in the room for this, and I'm, I'm sorry to say she's actually at the right side, and she's taking the minutes for the meeting. Um, I like to, I'm just putting this up because actually as an organisation, we've gone through a lot of change over that 50 years. Um, and it culminated last year in that we appointed our first ever female chief executive, um, and that's Professor Jane Elliott. She's a professor of sociology at the um, Institute for Education. Um, she specialises in quantitative methodology, and she was actually director of one of our major investments, which is our Centre for Longitudinal Studies, which I'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. So, yeah, we are changing, and actually our committees now... Not every single one of them, but they're broadly 50-50 men and women, so we are, we are moving forward. Okay, so what, so what do we do? Um, when I first joined ESRC, this is one of the first things I learned about what we actually do. And it is true to say they're guiding principles and they also kind of give you a feel of, of the types of things we're doing. So first, quality. It is that everything we do, all the research we fund, is through open competition and it really does have a transparent and rigorous peer review process. Sometimes that leads to the criticism that we're slightly bureaucratic because it does take time to get all, the, all those systems in place. But I think it does mean that we are funding the very best quality research. And we're doing a lot in the last five, ten years where we're working increasingly with international partners. And one of the things that they say they value most is the quality kite mark that we bring to those collaborations. Impact. We want the research that we fund to make a difference. It's so it can shape our public policy, make businesses, voluntary bodies and other organisations more effective. I'm not going to linger on that point too much because we've got some presentations coming up in a little bit which talks about it a bit more. And then independence. Yes, we are funded publicly, but we do have our Royal Charter, and it's something that we guard quite fiercely. When we're looking at working with other sectors, we really do think, is this going to compromise our independence? 
And I think we're quite proud that sometimes we give the message to government that actually they don't want to hear. So although we receive our funding from them, it's not always the message that they, they don't always get the message from our research that they might want to. And we don't have any in-house research capability. All the research we fund is through universities. Okay. So we're actually just at what we call it. They just launched, I think it was January the 15th, our new strategic plan. And that sets out how we're going to work and our major areas of activities for the next five years. So I would encourage you to go and look on our website generally because you can find out a bit more about us. But this is a really kind of, it's the most up-to-date document we have which kind of sets out where we're going. And it was informed by a public consulta uh, uh, consultation last summer. Um, we had, I think, over 150 responses. About 90 of those would be on an organisational level, so a lot from the institutions that, that you're part of. But we also worked hard to really consult with our other stakeholders. And we had a number of ways in doing that. We had a series of lunches with some of our business and, and public sector and voluntary sector stakeholders. Um, and what we've developed is being condensed into this strategy. I should say that this is... Um, it's a high-level document, and what I'm going to talk about today is some of our key areas of activities. It doesn't, though, touch on what our specific research challenges are at the moment, and that's because this is a document that we use for the next five years, and we want to be responsive as an organisation to the new challenges that emerge over that period. Um, so as research councils, we all do something that sounds very dry. I'm going down the slightly technical bureaucratic line. We do a delivery plan which sets out what we're going to do on an annual basis. Um, and we won't actually be releasing that till, till later in the year. And that's because all government organisations are going through, after the election, what's called a comprehensive spending review. When we find out how much money we're going to have, and, and as you might have get, gleaned from, from all watching the news, it's going to be quite a challenging time. So we've got quite a fight on our hands to make sure that we make the strongest possible case for social science. Um, and that's one of the reasons we talk really strongly about impact and one of the reasons that we did really well um, four years ago compared to other public sector bodies was that we were really able to make that case about the value of social science. So these are our four key areas of activities. I should say that we look at them in an integrated way. They're not intended to be silos. So, for example, in fostering research and innovation, we want to encourage people to use our large data sets and, and, and data resources that we've put together. But at the same time, that means that we have to make sure that we're building the capacity to use them. So they're very much, we want to look at them in an integrated way. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just talk through um, some of those areas. So fostering research and innovation. We want to fund the very best research that we can. Um, and we have a number of, of ways in which we do that. We offer a variety of schemes. Our funding scale is quite broad. We range from between 30,000, I think is our smallest award through our research seminars, right through to 10 million pound set research centres. Um, we want to encourage the most ambitious initiative. I think sometimes there's a tendency to think that as a, a public body there's a degree of conservatism in what we fund and we really want to push that. We're happy to take risks, there need to be informed risks, but we recognise that sometimes we, you know, you, there's a, a degree to which there's unknown when you're testing the boundaries. Um, we have our portfolio, we want to really have a breadth of research and I think this is something that we're particularly highlighting in this period moving forward. You might have heard that we fund in two modes. We have what's called responsive, where you can come to us on any topic of research, versus other ones where we're more strategic. We've worked with our stakeholders and we've identified where we think there's going to be a really valuable contribution for social science to make, and we direct our competitions in those areas. But we are really committed to that responsive element. We think it's what gives, is going to give the breadth of our portfolio. And it also gives us a head up to some of the new and emerging areas, which actually might not yet be coming through some of our, our discussions and more strategic dis, um, relationships, but are actually really important for the, for the next period moving forward. Um, and and I, I think another feature of how we're working is that we are working more in collaboration and partnership. Um, we think that's a really good way of making sure that our research has maximum impact, but also it does lever in quite a significant amount of co-funding. This, for the period 30, the uh, financial year 13-14, we levered in almost £18 million. Pound. So for every pound that ESRC put into a partnership, we gained £2 back from the partner, um, which really helps that uh, our funding go further. Um, 
what I've put up here, and I'm sorry, I'm sure you can't read it at the back, but we will make the slides available, is one of the areas that I think we haven't traditionally funded as much is actually synthetic research. Um, and I just wanted to pip your interest in maybe something you'll follow up is we've started funding uh, a major partner in the government's What Works initiative. And this is about making sure that government can have maximum access to the high quality research that is there. And they need help in doing that. They need us to, to pull out which is the strongest research across a broad range of, of areas. Um, and we've already had some really good successes with our What's Work centres. I've just put a, a couple of examples there. Um, hotspot policing. Um, they've really found that actually patrolling in small areas where crime's been concentrated really does have an impact. It doesn't seem to disperse it to other areas. Um, a different area is employment training review, which revealed that shorter, more practical on-the-job training um, was far more um, um, effective than, than longer-scale initiatives. Okay. So the second key area of activity is creating and maximising our data infrastructure. And I thought I should probably start by saying what we mean by our data infrastructure. Um, so part of it is our large-scale longitudinal studies. And we have a number of these. And they're really large-scale representative studies of, a, of, of the population. And they're seen as the jewels in the crown because actually they increase in value over time. So the more we learn about the participants, the richer the information becomes. And we've started this some time ago in terms of our funding. So we have um, the birth cohorts, which are tracking um, from childhood, from birth. So we have the 1958, the 1970. We then have a bit of a gap from the Thatch years where we didn't have any of our longitudinal studies funded, and you funded. And then 2000, we have the millennium cohort. And then our most recent, most exciting is life study. Um, which is going to be going into the field this year, has been doing some pilot work, which is aiming to track up to 100,000 babies pre-birth. So they're starting at the 28th weeks of pregnancy. So it's something really exciting and it's a very big logistical exercise. And what's really interesting about some of these data is actually we're now starting to innovate in some of the measures that we're bringing in. So that we're starting across all these studies to work with the Med Medical Research Council to look at the interplay between the bio, um, biomedical factors and social science. Um, then the other type is administrative um, and business data. And this is the kind of routinely collected information by a range of organisations that actually has really quite enormous value to us as social scientists. And I think the particularly interesting bit is when we combine some of our longitudinal studies with some of the administrative data. Um, so these are really what we see as a, a big, big resource for social scientists. And we have the UK Data Service, which is based at the University of Essex, but actually encompasses a number of other institutions as partners, which we see as a really as the kind of key access point for a number of these, um, of a number of our data investments. So if you're looking at, at our second, at doing secondary data analysis, it's a really good starting point. And I would really encourage you to learn more about some of these data resources. And we've actually got, and I can't see in the room, we've got Professor, Ver oh, he's right at the very back, standing, <laughs> standing there. We've got Professor Vernon Gale, who's from the University of Edinburgh. And he's actually doing a piece of work for us at the moment, um, looking at how we can increase the access for, to these um, important data longitudinal studies um, for our early career researchers. So he's really keen to talk to you. He wants to get an understanding of what experience you've had of them, what knowledge, what some of the barriers might be to you actually accessing them. He's going to be on the ESRC stall, so please do go and have a chat with him. If not, he might collar a few of you, because um, we're really keen to, to make them as accessible as possible. That's me just pulling up another example, um, and it's one that's kind of related to um, the study aspect, which is IFS did a piece of work looking at we're using administrative data, which found that students from less affluent backgrounds were, were more likely to drop out of, of university, uh, were likely to, more likely to drop out or graduate with a, a lower class degree than those from our affluent backgrounds. But the interesting bit, some of would say well, that was slightly intuitive. Um, was that actually when they came in on the course and if they had the same qualifications, those from the worst performing schools compared with those from the best performing schools tend to do better. So, so, there was, so that was quite important for looking at um, universities' admissions policies. Okay. So what we're going to be focusing on in terms of what we want to do on the data, so I was explaining what it was. 
We've made a considerable investment in those data resources over the last five, ten years. So what we really want to do now, as I keep saying that word, is make sure everybody's using it and getting the best value out of it. Um, and so over the next period, we're really going to be looking at how we, how we support that. And that links into the work that I'm going to talk about in terms of building capacity. But the other dimension is also making sure it's sustainable. So these babies that we're going to recruit this year and going to track them over their lifetime, they're probably going to live near, you know, a good proportion of them will hopefully live into their 90s, even to 100. So that's a very long-term investment for us. Um, in fact, I was talking to one of our advisors, he's actually a member of the 1958 birth cohort, and he's obviously still participating in that. So they are really a long-term deal with us. And, and what we're trying to think about is are there innovative ways in which we can collect some of this data. They're all using, the, a lot of them are using the gold standard of face-to-face -face interviews. And we're starting to think other ways in which we can use web-based technologies, which would, in some ways, for some generations, it's a more accessible and more likely to get um, a good response. But obviously, for other um, people within that population, it, it's less attractive. So we're trying to think about how we do that moving forward. And we need to work quite closely with the institutions who hold these data for us. OK. So building capacity, and I guess that's where most of you feel you probably sit within ESRC and our activities at the moment. Um, as I said, we support a lot of postgraduate students, but it's not all we do even on the skills and, and methodological development side. We have, my team has responsibility for looking at the support that we provide across the career path. Yes, quite a lot of it is concentrated at the early career stage, but particularly at the moment and some of this, the capacity issues that we know we've got to address they're actually pushing us to, to look beyond that. So some of the real opportunities that we've got with our data, the new, um, these big studies, but also some of the new, maybe on form data, the social media data, that's actually the whole social science research community having to develop their skills to use those. And so we're actually thinking through some of our investments, our National Centre for Research Methods and the methodological development it does and the training programmes, is how do we actually get everybody able to use this data? Because it takes quite a while to train you guys and actually what we need to be able to do is have people coming through in the pipeline able to, but also people who can start using it now. Um, but one thing you might be glad to hear is that we're actually starting to really think about that support that we provide in the immediate post-PhD period and it was one of the strong things that came through our consultation with the community was we've got great support in the post, in, through the doctoral training centres, we have our future research leader schemes but no, maybe not everybody's ready for the future research leader scheme when they immediately graduate and it's actually fiercely competitive so what we're doing at the moment is going to be working with a number of other organisations who support um, Po, po, that immediate post PhD phase and look at are there different ways in which we can provide support for that important transition. Okay. So, how you fit in the picture? It's really important to us, and our council is we have a council of nearly about 14 senior academics who really do guide what we do. And one of the things they're absolutely committed to is that we need to be developing the next generation of social scientists. Um, we have 21 doctoral training centres and we fund 600 studentships every year. Um, we are particularly keen to build capacity in some priority areas, but we do cover the full breadth of the social sciences. So our DTCs are interdisciplinary and they cover the full 19 disciplines that, that we support. But some of you might actually be on studentships where we've offered enhanced stipends to encourage you and to promote the use of advanced quantitative methods. Um, some of the DTCs have been pushed to recruit students in other areas where we, we feel there's a real need to build capacity, for example, management and business and some aspects of economics. Um, and I guess the point that I would really keen to get across and what I see as a real value of an ESRC studentship is, it really is more than just a standard, standard PhD. We want you to become next to social scientists. So I think some of it isn't reflected in the type of training that we would really encourage and want you to undertake. Yes, we want you to really obviously do the depth in your particular area, but we want you to have a broad understanding of the social science methods, so qualitative and quantitative. We want you to really develop your professional skills um, and take, the opportunity, take advantage of the opportunities that we provide to work internationally, to work in collaboration um, with non-academic organisations um, and undertake, some, for example, internships. 
Um, they're really twee bit and it sounds corny and I've put it there and I'm slightly embarrassed that I've put the ESRC family but it's trying to make the point <laughs> that um, we do these conferences in part for your first year and we also do it in your final year and that we want you to feel part of the ES. So there's a broad community of researchers who are funded and work with the ESLC. We really want you to feel part of that. We want you to get to know each other, but we, would like, we want to know what's going to happen with you. We want to see how your, um, your careers progress. Some of you may stay in academia. Some of you may go outside and have um, really important roles doing social science based or contributing through the, the work you've done, um, through your studies research roles that really draw on your social sciences and, and we feel both of those are equally valuable. We wouldn't fun be funding 600 studentships a year if we just wanted to have people go into academic research careers and I know when a lot of people start their PhD that's really where you're thinking at and hopefully today with some of the speakers they'll be able to show some of the really important roles that people actually do outside academia. Um, so yeah, we, it's kind of the first contact with us but hopefully we'll, we'll keep that going throughout your careers. Finally, um, this is the fourth area of activity and I think I probably touched on it quite a bit in terms of why we want to work in partnership. The bit that I maybe haven't said is that we want to get absolute maximum out of the social science that we research. We want it to have maximum benefit and impact for society in that, in that broadest sense. And to do that we need to work in partnership and work in dialogue and have good knowledge exchange and discuss how we're taking forward the research agenda um, with a range of organisations. And that's one of the reasons we're really keen to, for you to develop some of these skills in their, your, these areas. We're going to in the next session talk about impact, what we mean by it and some of the skills we're talking about. But just getting used to working with a range of organisations, understanding the different cultures, how actually if you're working in a public sector organisation that message might need to be still to have the maximum value. Um, so some of you might be actually be already be on collaboratively funded studentships, um, but what you, we hope you'll find out today is that actually we've got a number of mechanisms through which we want to kind of encourage you to develop your relationships and skills. Okay. So just reflect um, quickly and then I'll take a few questions if anybody, if we've got time for a couple of questions. One, two, okay. Um, so learn about us, take advantage of the funding and the opportunities we're there. As David said, you made a great decision by coming here and that you'll hopefully find out more about them. Um, encourage you to talk to each other as well. It's a real opportunity to find, talk to like-minded people and also learn about different areas of social science. Um, and also we are keen to hear how you found the conference. There are some notice boards downstairs. Please stick up any responses that you have on those. Okay, thank you. Happy to take any questions.